chapter number 55. Last, or this past week, I should say, there was something myself and a few others of us were praying about, hoping to come to pass, and even seemed like it was going to work out. But then all of a sudden it came to naught, and it went, it went away, and, and it, it failed, if you will. It, it didn't come to pass. You know, as I sat back in my office this past week and thinking about the situation, I just thought to myself, why? Why? Not in a disrespectful way to God, but in my mind it just didn't make a whole lot of sense. And as I thought and prayed about the situation, the, the Lord brought to my mind these verses and reminded me of an important truth about our walk of faith. And that's that God's ways are distinctly different and higher than our ways. Distinctly different and much higher than ours. And some things in life, well, plainly, we just don't always understand why they turn out the way they do. But thankfully, God is sovereign over all affairs in of our lives. And we can rest assured that in the end, we'll understand more fully the truth expressed in our passage here this morning. If you found Isaiah 55, let's look for verses number 8 and 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, you ever wonder what God is doing? <laughs> ever question why He didn't allow something to come to pass? Or you pray over something, you put a lot of effort towards something, and you just are you're just kind of like, I don't understand this. I don't understand what's going on. Well, we're going to discover that truth a little bit more today as we talk about being grounded. In God's ways. Grounded in God's ways. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for just being a great God. And I do pray that you would speak to our hearts here today. I do pray that uh, you give us understanding about this concept we're going to talk about here. Because certainly we all have questions and wonder why sometimes certain things aren't coming to pass or some things uh, don't ever come to pass or why we were rejected or, or things that just we think were positive, but really would have been negative had it come to the past. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you illuminate our understanding here today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I believe one of the reasons why Christians fall out of the Christian race sometimes is due to the fact that they have not accepted the truth that I'm going to be talking about here this morning. Uh, they, they live very frustrated lives. They're, they're frustrated with God. They're frustrated with, with uh, living for God, so to say. And Supposedly the truths of the Word of God, the promises of the Word of God aren't making a whole lot of sense. They're discouraged, they're depressed, and they're defeated. You know, and, they, and what eventually happens is it, they can't sustain that, of course, and they give up on God. You know, they might still come to church, but really, in essence, they've given up on God. And, in fact, they get mad at God. They may even blame others. They may get short with others. And they're living a very spiritually void life. Because one of the greatest challenges, I think, in our Christian walk is accepting the truth we're going to deal with here today. Is that God's ways are better and higher than our ways, and His thoughts are bigger and higher than our thoughts. You know, we'll look at events in life, especially ones that we were hoping to see happen and anxiously waiting to occur. We'll have those times where they get delayed. And sometimes delayed indefinitely. We, we don't even know if they're ever going to come to pass. Or sometimes it's just simply shot down. The door is slammed in your face. You ever had a door slammed in your face? Maybe not literally, but, but spiritually or, or with things that you were seeking after. It's just like, it, it just looked like the door was going to be open. As you're approaching it, bam, it slams you right in the face. <laughs> I've had that plenty of times. More times than I want to admit. And that can be quite heart-wrenching at times. You know, the Bible talks about hope deferred, making the heart sick. You ever been hoping for something, waiting on something? And it's just making your heart sick and it's heart-wrenching. And you look at the situation from your personal perspective, and from all angles, it doesn't seem like there would be a good reason why. I mean, you're calculating it out, and it's like, this just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense why it's the way it is right now. Now, a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior can certainly struggle because they're subject to the winds of life. You know what? They don't have God. They don't know God. They're without God. They're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, the Bible talks about. They don't know God. They're, they're subject to chance. They're subject to things that are, that are just happening. And really, things really don't make a whole lot of sense. There's no uh, working out for a greater good in their lives. 
But God's people, those who have trusted Christ as their Savior, those who have been born again, those who have been saved, as the Bible puts it, God is orchestrating things in this, for a distinct reason in your life. And by the way, you cannot compare your life with anybody else's. The Bible talks about it, I can't remember the exact passage, but it's not wise to compare ourselves uh, between ourselves. Why? Because we're all unique, we're all distinct, we're all different, we all react differently to circumstances and situations in life, and we can't, we can't judge it any other way. We just got to understand that God's, what God is doing, He's doing for a reason. And sometimes those reasons make very little sense to us. We saw this verse last week in Ecclesiastes 3.11 as we talked about uh, God's timing of things. It says, He had made everything, you know, as beautiful in His time. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. In other words, there's going to be times where, uh, yeah, it's going to come out good in the end, but you're not always going to understand what he's doing. You don't understand why he's doing what he's doing. And uh, sometimes you just got to kind of hold on to him and, and not let go. You know, I think of Job. Job, during his trials, he, he didn't know what was happening. Now, we, in, in this point in history, have the book of Job. We... God reveals to us what was taking place. But Job never knew. And died never knowing why all those trials took place. Why he lost his uh, children. Why he lost all of his wealth. Why he lost the loyalty of his wife. Why he lost his health. I mean, he had no clue what was going on. God did, though. And God doesn't even reveal it to him. I'm sure he knows now. I'm sure he's read, or read the book of Job, maybe up in heaven or something like that. Well, that's what was going on. I didn't know that. And he can say, oh, I get it now. But at the time, he had no clue. It wasn't that Job was a bad man either. Job 1.1, 1, 1, it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And, and that man was, notice, perfect and upright, the one that feared God and feared evil. He was a good man. In fact, the Bible lists him later on one of the prophets as being one of the, one of the most spiritual men, basically, that existed. He was a, he, he was a good man. There, there, it wasn't like he was doing something wrong, per se. But when he lost everything, it just made no sense to him personally at all. Of course, then he had his, his good buddy show up and, and uh, let him know how wrong he was on all these things. You know, like they had a better perspective on it. You know, God rebukes them, of course, for it, if you know the end of the story. But I'm thankful as well. One of God's children, God is always trying to do something in our lives to further our growth and our ability to produce fruit. And He'll often do it in ways we don't understand. You know, just a few weeks ago we had a we had a Stephen Benita Epley here, and he, and he told that testimony about his daughter who lost twins. I think I think she had them at 19 weeks or 20 weeks, something like that. They only lived for a few short short minutes and, and passed on into eternity and. And uh, they had that, they sung that song that was connected. That, you know, that's got to be hard. Right? That had to be hard when that took place. But he gave the testimony of how, uh, you know, his daughter was telling her, her husband or whatever the case was, God's ways are the best ways. God's ways are the best ways. And they just kept serving God. And they kept going. And he's pastoring a good-sized church now. And uh, doing well, from what I understand. But I tell you something, that doesn't make sense. Losing twins. Losing, you know, why would God do that? Why would God allow that? Why, 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 why? You know, there's some Christians that, that they go through much less than that. That have just told God, I don't want anything to do with you anymore because you're not, I, I, I can't understand what you're doing and I'm not going to even trust you or, or try. But is that the right mentality? No, it's not. And getting grounded in this truth will save us from becoming bitter and defeated when our circumstances don't make sense because there's going to be plenty of times in the Christian walk, life just doesn't make sense. Experienced it a number of times. Especially the last five years. As we're trying to figure out certain things and so forth and, and uh, had some disappointments, had some setbacks, we had some victories too, which is great. But those setbacks and those disappointments often have been precursors for greater victories later down the road. God's usually got to prepare our hearts and work on our hearts before He can bring those victories. And sometimes He doesn't reveal things just so that we, our hearts are getting prepared. But too often, Christians make the wrong decision. They get bitter at God. And they get defeated. 
and they fall out. I hope you're not in the position of almost falling out of the Christian race here today. Because nobody has to be casual to you spiritually. Not a single person here has to be casual. But it's going to be based on the truths that you choose to accept or the truths you reject. And today this is a very important one to understand. Because when you understand God's ways are higher than your ways, and His thoughts and your thoughts, it's going to make a tremendous difference how you approach life and the decisions that you make. When we grasp this truth, it's going to make it, things are going to be a lot better. We'll be able to move on past some of those disappointments and go forward for the glory of God. As we consider being grounded in God's ways, let's first off see what I call a distinction. A distinction. You know, as we view our text, we notice that God draws a very distinct difference between His thoughts and ways versus our thoughts and our ways. Again, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. These verses tell us that as people, we do not think like God thinks at all. It says they are not. It's not like we're sort of close. We're on different planes compared to God. Now as I was thinking about this, meditating on this passage this week, I just thought about how great of a distinction there really is between the way God thinks and the way we think, and what God's ways and our ways. And to help us understand that great distinction, God draws a comparison. It shows us the distance between our thoughts and our ways and His thoughts and His ways. He says here, for the, as the heavens are higher than the earth. There's a comparison here. It's the distance, if you will, to be compared to how high the heavens are above the earth. They got me thinking about that a little bit. What is the distance between <coughs> sea level and the and where outer space starts? Because that's the heavens. What's the distance? Well, I, I did a little research and I found out there's a distinct boundary called the Carmain line. It's the distinct boundary between what is considered Earth, of course that's our atmosphere and so forth, and outer space. And I was surprised how high it actually is. 62 miles from sea level. Now, I've flown in an airplane before, and many of you have here as well, and you get up to maybe 36, maybe 37,000 feet. I don't know if they get much higher than that, unless it's a specialized plane, but I'm talking about a commercial airline jet. You know, that's, you know, I'm not a math wizard, but that's six miles, roughly, five, six miles above the surface of the Earth. They fly, you look down, and, and and you can't hardly see anything and so forth. You're so high up. But that's <laughs> six miles is only a, roughly a tenth of the actual distance between sea level and what is considered outer space. That means that there is a great disparity between what we think and what God is thinking because the point is that God's ways and thoughts are really miles apart get that idea. And that's the idea I think God's trying to communicate. That there is a significant distinction or difference between the way we think and what God thinks. The scriptures communicate that thoroughly. It, it, we see a few examples here like Luke 16 verse 15. He said unto them, Fear they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men, what does it say? Is it an abomination of the sight of God? No, there's some things that man highlights and trumps and thinks are necessary and, and, and so forth. God calls it a nation. And, uh, and sometimes we get that mentality too. We think that certain things have to be in place to, uh, to, be, uh, to be well off and so forth. But, but God, there, there's a great disparity between what man thinks and what God thinks. What God, man highly esteems versus what God highly esteems. You know, man trumps talent. Man trumps treasure. And, you know, a person's got fame and fortune and, and uh, charisma and smarts. And, you know, we look at that person, they're going to be well off. They're going to be successful, so forth. You know what God, to God, that's an abomination. <laughs> you know what God's looking primarily 
for his people? Their heart. Where's their heart at? So that I can, God can make up all the lack of talent and ability and so forth. But he looked for a person that has a heart. Him. All those other things that we highly esteem as being necessary for a person to be successful, if you will, mean nothing to God if their heart is not right with him. You know, I was, I was reading this morning, uh, I believe it was 2 Chronicles chapter 1, and, and it's that story where, it's the portion of the scripture where Solomon asked God for wisdom to rule the people of Israel that he had just received after the death of his father, David. And it mentions in there that God recognized something, that that request was in his heart. In other words, that was a heart, a sincere heart desire. You know, God's looking at our hearts more than anything else. Man doesn't see things that way. There's a great disparity between what God thinks and what we think. We don't always see the hearts of people behind something that God does. See, again, what we often value, God does. 1 Corinthians 3.19 For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He had taken the wise in their own craftiness. You know, the world's philosophy that discredits and dispels the need for God can appear quite intelligent. And there, you know, there's some very intelligent people that can argue and debate and so forth and, and uh, and can come up with all this reasoning and so forth, but God calls all that nonsense foolishness. There are many intelligent people out there, but their intelligence has made them fools. Romans 1.22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Again, the whole point is this. God knows, God understands, God comprehends and operates at an intelligence level that is eons above our comprehension level. Even the smartest, brightest people in the planet couldn't even begin to compare to what God understands and knows. And we're out of our league when we think our rationalization and thoughts are comparable to God or even trump God. Oh, I don't think that. <laughs> uh, I think we would be more guilty of that than what we give than what we're fessing up to. Because God sometimes tells us one thing, but we keep doing the other. And uh, God keeps telling us that, keeps telling us that, keeps telling us that, and we keep doing the other thing, because we've rationalized certain things in life. You know, God gives us His book as guidelines, as, as directional steps to help us with our choices. If we make these choices that are contradicting those guidelines, we're in the wrong. But sometimes people justify that wrongness. And thinking that God's behind it. Can I say that's God not behind it? When you're breaking his word, he is not behind it. It doesn't matter how much you justify it, or I justify it. We're out of our league when we're challenging God's rationale. Psalm 131 1 says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lifted up, neither do I exercise myself in great matters, or in things too high for me. You know what? We're out of our league when we think that our rationalization of, dis, of disobeying God's word or God's reasoning tries to trump it. And we must understand this great distinction of reasoning ability between us and God. It is tremendously huge. I mean, we're, we're, we're eons of we're miles apart, if you will. There is that great distinction. Secondly, that leads us to a decision. Depending on how much we understand and respect God's superior knowledge and ways will determine the decisions that we make in life. When we are convinced God's ways are superior to ours, we won't have a problem stepping out by faith and obeying the commands of God. We'll have a problem because why? He knows best. He knows what he's, he knows what he's doing, even though I don't know what he's doing. I can, I can, I can trust him with that. So yeah, how does that happen, though? Or how come... We won't have a problem stepping out by faith because our judgment will not be cluttered and clouded by our own rationale. Sometimes it's our own rationale that gets in the way. You know, the Bible does tell us, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 4, we walk by faith, not by sight. Just because you can't see certain things doesn't mean that that's the way you should react. We should react to decisions based upon the principles of the Word of God. I mean, that's why God gives us His Word. To be a light unto our feet and to our path. To give us direction. 
They help us with those decisions because there are a lot of decisions that we need to make. And we've got we we need some help with that. But sometimes we rationalize something because we don't want to do something that God's told us that we need to do. Again, some things that God commands us to do requires an understanding that His ways are always the best ways to follow, even regardless of the immediate consequences. You know, I think of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had a fiery ministry. I mean, you talk about a fiery preacher. Talk about a guy who stuck the finger in the, in the eye of the people, so to say. But boy, he, he really had some fruit. But God told him to go confront Herod about the wickedness of his life. What ended up happening when he did that? Well, Luke 3, 19 and 20 says, But Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him, John the Baptist, for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done. Had it yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. God told him to go to Herod and confront him about his sin. And this is the thanks he gets. Eventually he's going to be beheaded unjustly. If you know the rest of the story. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I guess John had to come to the point where it doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense to me or not. It makes sense to God. But it affected his decision. You know, he could have, he could have rationalized, rationalize, you know, I, you know if, if I go to Herod, he might throw me in prison. He might behead me. You know, but if I stay out here and disobey what God's telling me to do, I can win more people to Christ and so forth. And maybe better. But was that what God wanted him to do? Wow. See how it can affect our decisions. I think of another situation. If you go to the book of Daniel, just a few uh, books ahead, about the three Hebrew children. If you're not familiar with the story, there was there was uh, four Hebrew children. They're not really children anymore. I guess they're men at this point. That were uh, taken from Jerusalem to Babylon during the Babylonian captivity when Nebuchadnezzar came in and ransacked and destroyed Jerusalem and, and, the, and the country of Judah. And, and they were brought into captivity for some time. And uh, there was four that were that were named out in this book, of course, Daniel himself, and then there was three others by the name of their Hebrew names, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have, they have uh, Hebrew names, actually. But those were, those were the Babylonian names. But there came a time when Nebuchadnezzar got this bright idea to erect this golden idol, and then he commanded everybody present to bow down to it, the minute the music played. Well... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were faithful to God. And they weren't going to bow down to that idol. This is a great story. Lots of ways you can preach it. But you notice here in Daniel 3, verse 16, they had a choice they had to make. And they made a good one. It says here in, in Daniel 3, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, and our worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And they knew what that meant. They are going to be cast in the furnace. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar goes ahead and, and uh, ups the temperature about seven times what it was already. I mean, it was horrible. I mean they are facing a horrible situation here. A horrible death. They were presented with a choice here. What do we do? Well, they could have rationalized and say, you know, well, uh, we can save our skins. We can still serve God if we um, we just bow down this night. Maybe nobody will notice. But they knew God would notice. And they weren't trying to please men here. They were trying to please God. And they understood that God's ways were higher than their ways, and His thoughts and their thoughts. And they said, we're not going to do it. We're going to just trust God with this. You know, He's able to save us, but if not, they're going to serve him anyways. Oh, what a powerful testimony. God, we need Christians like that more than ever today. We had so many that bend at little things. Bend for their careers, bend for their relationships, bend to everything. But these people, in the face of a horrible death, said, no, we're going to stay faithful to God. Boy, God honored that. You know the rest of the story. Great miracle took place. Shook 
a lifeline of Nebuchadnezzar. I don't doubt it was something that was a precursor to it, even his salvation. I believe he got saved eventually. So read Daniel chapter 4. Again, their human reasoning would have said, spare yourself at all costs. But they knew what God said. And they feared him. And they said, we're going with him. His understanding is higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. He's put us in this situation for a reason. Whether or not he spares us or not, we're going to stay faithful all the way to the end. Talk about some faith. You talk about some people that that understood that God's ways were higher than their ways. Then there was Moses. If you go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Moses Moses uh, grew up under under the, the realm of, of the Pharaoh. And, of course, he was, he was considered the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he had a choice that he had to make. He knew he was a Hebrew. Evidently, according to some of the verses you read about Moses, he knew that God had somewhat called him to be the deliverer of the nation of Israel. But he was going to have to do it a whole down the way. He was going to have to forsake Egypt. Now he could rationalize and say, you know what, maybe when I get to be Pharaoh, which was a reasonable possibility for him, I can just let him go. And I can keep, I can keep all my blind women in song that, I, that I've always dreamed to have that the Pharaoh has. They had to make a choice. Because that was not what God wanted. And you see that he did. Of course, you read the, the Old Testament, but it, it sums it up well here in Hebrews 11, verse 24. And by faith, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for receiving for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had reckon, respect and the recompense of the reward. It was going to cost him <coughs> to obey God. But he did. And I don't think he's regretting it today. I want that. Then there was Abraham. God told him to leave his homeland, the land of us, or our land of earth, excuse me, and settle in a future location for his lineage, where his lineage would raise up and become a mighty nation. You can go to Hebrews 11, verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have received, after received for an inheritance, obeyed, he went out, notice, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. You know, he could have rationalized, that doesn't make any sense. I don't even know where I'm going. I'm just going to sit and wait here until God tells me what to do. In the meantime, I'm, not, I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to serve God. I'm not going to do... I'm just waiting. Because I want to know specifically every detail of His plan before I'll even begin to go in that direction. To rationalize that. <laughs> now, he, God told him to go. Say, all right, let's go. <laughs> Your ways are higher than my ways. Now, all these people had to decide in their life, was God's way the best? Or should I respond to my own human reasoning in these circumstances and disobey God? Of course, should they have done that, of course, that number one would be sin. If you break God's commands, that's always sin. Number two, there would be no lasting fruit. Even if they had built something up, it would not last. Number three, it would be costly in ways they would have never thought. And usually that's what ends up happening. You know, are we convinced in our hearts and minds that God's ways are the best ways? Now, we can say yes, oh, oh yeah, of course. But that will be challenged. That will be challenged. Maybe it was challenged this past week for you. Maybe it will be challenged this, past, this next week or the next month or the next year. God will present opportunities that will either confirm that belief or show us that we don't really believe that. Now the question will be, will we obey God regardless of the cost, knowing His ways are the best ways? What if obeying God cost you a, your job? Or an opportunity? Or a relationship? Or a dream you have? Or finances? Or in your life? All those things, some folks have, it's cost them. Understanding, though, 
God's ways and thoughts are better than theirs. You know, it's been very easy to be a Christian in America for many, many years. Times are changing. Oh, there's a lady out in Oregon today. So, I think she's 70 years old. I was a florist. Getting hammered now about because she would refuse to do the flowers up at a gateway. God bless her, she's standing by her. And, and she's been threatened of who's everything. She's, she's 70 years old. But I'll give her kudos, she's got some courage. She's sticking by her guns. And, and, and from what I understand, at least in the situation. I say, oh, that's tragic. You know what? That's commonplace around the globe. You should, you've been hearing some of the stories out of the Middle East. I mean, I, I've been hearing of children being decapitated for claiming Christ by that ISIS group. And we've got a world that just kind of is yawning at that right now. I really do pray that we get a good leader in our country coming up here in these next elections. It's got some intestinal fortitude to say, no, this stuff's wrong. Do something about it. Tell you something. It was caught there. I mean, this gift cost cost their lives. And they have to believe that. Hey, God's ways are the best ways. Are they in your life too? Are his thoughts superior to your thoughts? I think certainly every one of us needs to be grounded more. I'll be the first to I do. God will teach us that through life. Well, thirdly, what's great is that it'll lead to a destination. A destination. As challenging as it might be, what is great is the fact that accepting and surrendering, and sometimes that's the biggest problem for Christians, is just surrendering a stubborn will, <laughs> a prideful thought and thinking process to God. The fact that might be what God's waiting to do, waiting for you or me or whatever the case may be, do in our circumstances before He'll even act. There must be that willingness to surrender and accept. But when we do it, we've been given promises that it always leads to a positive destination. You know, we never regret giving God the benefit of the doubt in life's circumstances. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good, but then that love God, but then we're called according to His purpose. You know, God is a good God. You believe that to you today. You believe God is a good God. I mean, everything about Him is good. He does no wrong. He's always orchestrating things for a good outcome in the end. Ecclesiastes 7.8 says, Better is the end of the thing than the beginning thereof. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Yet, the, at the onset, it might not look very positive. There might be a lot of setbacks. There might be a lot of discouragement. There might, I mean, you might go on for quite some time like that. But if you just say, God's ways are best ways. His thoughts are higher than mine. I'm just going to be faithful. I'm going to just plug forward. I'm just going to do what I know what I need to do. Better is the end of the thing than the end thereof. It, it'll come out in the end. Through that process, God's molding you and I into the image of Christ. You know, that's the whole part of this series, grounded and growing, is that you become you and I become more like Jesus so that we can bring him more glory and honor. By the way, you'll be a lot more at peace and a lot more fulfilled in this life than, uh, than a lot of people. And often we don't see that right away. I understand. I've been there. But God promises us that we'll never regret going along with Him, even when our human reasoning tells us different. Why? Because we've got, we've been given great, exceeding, great, precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the world as in or the corruption that is in the world through us. We're given unto us great, exceeding, great and precious promises. These promises anchor us and help us press on when we can't see where everything is going to end up. But what do you do when, you, when you're confused and uncertain about the steps forward, though? Well, can I say that there's always a path forward? 
And sometimes the best steps are just the one, doing the ones that you know are right to do correctly. So I don't know about this. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll just keep doing right as far as what you know. You're only re you're responsible for what you know. You're not responsible for what you don't know. And just keep plugging forward. Keep plugging forward. There's always a step <coughs> forward. Too bad that sometimes we take too many steps to the side. Or we retreat. Sometimes it's just doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. And in God's time, more direction will come that will lead into God's destination for us in various areas and avenues of life. The question is this, and maybe you have to ask yourself this, do I really want God's best in my life? Or am I more content and more driven at getting what I think is best? And sometimes that, that thinking needs to be surrendered and rejected. Because the Bible says in Psalm 84, verse 11, brother, Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So many times I thought about that verse as I was waiting on something earlier on in my life. And I could testify that no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Then do the right things. Again, God's definition of good, though, too, might be different than ours. It might be different than ours. But in the end, if we give God the benefit of the doubt, we'll come to agree with his definition and we'll say, yeah, I guess he was right. I guess he was right on this. You know, years ago, after I, I was getting towards the, my senior year of college, or uh, the last semester it was, I was going to try to get an a internship at this place up in Fargo called Great Plains, owned by Microsoft now. But from what I understood, the company was a great place to work and so forth, and a lot of positive things came out of it. And I was, a, I was attempting to get an internship there. And I had an applicant, I had, a, I had an interview, and it, and it went well, and the HR lady really seemed to like me and so forth. And, but I came up short, I came up number two. <laughs> and I was like, bummer, well, what am I going to do now? So I, so I, I kind of had a lax final semester. I had, I think I had basketball and running and weightlifting and a few other classes. It was a pretty lax semester, but I, I was like, I, I want to keep trying to get in there. Well, after that first interview, this, this, this HR lady really, really was, was kind to me. He said, there's this other job that's going to open up, and I'm going to get you in there right away. I said, yes, I don't think, you know, God's ways are better than my way, so I'm going to get this. And I had an interview, and the guy, I, it was a, I had that phone interview with a guy in Canada, and then I had an interview with this, and they kept saying things like, oh, we'll probably be offering you, you know, all this buildup. I get a call a week later and say, well, they've offered the position to another person. i like, what? I mean, I, I was like, what's going on here? Well, I'm getting to the end of the semester. I don't have a job. i got student loans, all $6,000. I'm making some of these college students jealous right now. It's a different day. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I had another interview with them, and that didn't go anywhere. But I was, at the time, our church was building a, a, their facility in Fargo, 40,000 square foot facility, a nine acres of land. And, and um, during that semester, because I had so few credits, I, I spent a little bit more time doing some volunteer work over there and, and so forth. And I don't know, it kind of came upon my heart about working there. I don't know why I was a new Christian. And honestly, I'm not a big construction guy. But uh, that kind of came to my heart. I started thinking, you know, maybe I, if it wasn't even for a job purpose, just I just wanted to help out. And I thought, well, maybe I could get by it so much. It was just things that were thinking in my heart. Well, one day while I was at the job site, the pastor that was about to talk to me was something, he got distracted for some reason. And something came on my heart, like, he's going to ask you to work here. Well, within 24 hours, he actually called me and said, would you be interested in working here? And I said, well, well yeah, I've actually kind of been thinking about that. Long story short, I started working there, but I was still applying for that place. I was trying to get in there. I thought, this is only the last of the summer. i got to get something else. And, and so forth. got me past my, at least to be able to start working after I was graduated. And, uh, and I had another interview, and that didn't go well. And I had a, a final interview with five interviews at this place. The last one was just like the door just slammed in my face. I like, what's going on here? Am I that big of a loser? Don't ask that, please. 
And uh, so I, I just kept working at it, and I, and I was looking for jobs, couldn't find anything. And uh, so I just settled in and I was working. I ended up working, it, the, the job lasted from what was supposed to be a summer working on the concrete parking lot to last about a year and a half. And uh, just doing something that honestly, I'll be honest with you, I don't really care for construction work all that much. And uh, it was during that time frame, God began working in my heart about the ministry. And, uh, you know, I have my dream, I have my job, I have everything I was trying to do and everything. And God, during that time frame, it was kind of, I call it kind of an incubation period for me spiritually. I was young in the Lord and gave me a good opportunity to be around some good people and serve the Lord. I had a chance to take a trip to Israel at the time, and then I went to, to South Korea for my first missions trip. I was there, God confirmed that He wanted to be a minister. And I began to see that God's ways are a little bit better than my ways. And uh, I can testify today that God's ways are perfect. You know, I had my ideas about what I wanted for my job. I even, even had an idea of who I wanted to marry, which wasn't at the time my, my wife was my husband's. And you know what, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that God's ways are better than my ways. But I had to come to the point where I realized that, and I, and I just had to surrender to that. Not always knowing the, the future. I didn't know we were going to come here. I didn't know a variety of things I was going to get to be a part of. But if I had gotten what I wanted, I, I guarantee I would not have experienced and been part of a lot of things I've had the opportunity to be part of. I was going to be a chance to be all over the world and all over this country and get to preach and, and, and to minister to him and, and, and for him and so forth. And you know what? <coughs> that trumps any job I would have gotten at that place. Let me tell you something. I can't even begin to talk, tell you about it. But God's ways are always perfect. The question is are we as people grounded in those ways to so the fact that we can accept them? as being better than our ways. Maybe today that might be what we need to do. Maybe you need to come down here. You know, let's not be ashamed to come down to the altar and bow to God and say, you know what, I'm, God, I, I, I just surrender about the need. Let's not be ashamed to do something like that. If that's, I mean, not trying to force anybody, I'm just saying, if, if God spoke to your heart, I would encourage you to respond to that. So that is pride that gets us in the way. It gets in the way of us responding to Him. Regardless if you do or if you don't, some point in time you're going to have to come to the point, all of us will, that God's ways are much better than all of us. Because if we don't accept that, we'll live to regret that. As we can see that our ways really don't lead to a whole lot. And that God's ways lead to an abundant life. Let's close with the